like, I want the pound. I was like, and I'm not playing. I'm just going to walk up on the stage and expect you to talk. Okay. So, yeah, so I am okay. a little bit angry about that. He's there. Okay. He's there. I mean, I don't really understand what's going on in terms of... Will you come to the front? Okay, hello everyone. While they're getting all set up on AV, I just wanted to welcome you all to the forum. The first thing I want to do is to acknowledge our co-chair, Amarachi, right over there. She put this whole weekend together. Okay, I am the forum director of this year's Black Arts Festival. My name is Kamala Salmon. The Black Arts Festival Board and I have worked very hard on this event and it is really wonderful to see all of you here today. I would like to thank our esteemed panelists and moderator for joining us today. I would also like to thank the IOP for its continued support of the Black Arts Festival. The Black Arts Festival was started six years ago by a former president of the Kumba Singers of Harvard College to increase the community's exposure to and knowledge, knowledge of various forms of black art. You will see this exemplified in the weekend's events, ranging from a visual art show to a performing art show to a film festival. The forum, the kickoff event of our festival, is dedicated to fostering debate and discussion of contemporary issues in black art today. This year's topic, Whose Music Is It Anyway?, explores an especially pertinent topic in music today. And with such renowned speakers, I'm sure, certain we will all benefit from the discussion. So without further ado, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to the festival and to this forum discussion. I will now turn it over to the moderator for this evening's event, Professor Ingrid Monson, the Quincy Jones Professor of Music in the African American Studies Department here at Harvard University. Professor Monson is best known for her scholarship in jazz music, having written such books as Saying Something, Jazz Improvisation and Interaction, and her most recent work, Freedom Sounds, Jazz, Civil Rights in Africa, 1950 to 1967. Professor Monson's interest in jazz is not just academic. She has actually worked as a professional jazz musician in the past. With such rich and varied experience, Professor Monson is an asset both to this university and to our discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kamala. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank the Black Arts Festival and Kamala Sa Salmon in pr particular for inviting me to moderate this event. Today's topic, Whose Music Is It Anyway?, asks several questions that have occurred and recurred in nearly every form of African American popular music in the 20th century. And some of these questions are, what does ownership of a music genre mean? Can a group retain ownership of a musical form that is being predominantly performed and popularized by others? Is it possible or desirable for any musical form to always remain tied to its creators? What does the success of non-African American artists mean for black music? From my perspective as a scholar of African American music, the interracial conversations that occur when these issues are discussed tend to get stuck on the same set of charges and countercharges, whether jazz, rock and roll, or hip hop are being discussed. There are three structural conditions that I would argue underlie this deba debate throughout the history of the music. The first is the history of racial segregation and discrimination in the music industry. Second, the undeniable musical debt that American popular musics, whether performed by African Americans or not, owe to black musical aesthetics. Thirdly, the erasure of African Americans that has occurred when white performers become popularizers of African American musical innovations, and especially its economic consequences. Throughout the 20th century, white performers have generally received a greater share of the financial rewards of genres like jazz and rock than, than the black performers who were their aesthetic models. This has occurred over and over again. Paul Whiteman in early jazz, Benny Goodman during the swing era, Elvis Presley in the 1950s, the Beatles in the 1960s, and more recently, the debate reemerges with Eminem. This is partly a function of demographics. 
that black Americans have been a numerical minority. It is not surprising under these circumstances that African Americans have often felt the need to remind the broader American public of the cultural origins of jazz, rock, and hip hop, and to take, uh, take steps toward greater black economic self-determination. The reaction of many white Americans and other non-African Americans has often been to cry foul, to suggest that African American insistence on recognition of black origins and the importance of black performance is an exclusionary move. People argue that music must be viewed as universal and ideally colorblind, with social or cultural background having no claim on leg legitimacy or authenticity. In my opinion, this reaction often misses the forest for the trees. As those of you who have been in my classes know, I often say something like, isn't it interesting that the part of African American experience that white Americans most frequently desire access to is the music? The fun part, not the problematic part. People say, wow, let's go hear Miles Davis or The Roots, but not let's go, to racially, let's go get racially profiled on the New Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> let's go live in North St. Louis and go to lousy schools. Let's buy a house on Chicago's west side and watch it appreciate in value far less than in white neighborhoods. If we are to get beyond the same old conversation about race, origins, legit legitimacy, and authenticity, it seems to me that the focus has to shift away from criticizing African Americans for reminding us of black origins and musical leadership. For after all, what other ethnic group is asked not to feel a special connection to its own music? We need instead to develop a more honest interracial awareness about how racial privilege, or lack thereof, continues to operate in American society in the 21st century. We're fortunate today to have four panelists eminently qualified to bring us up to date on these issues in the contemporary music world. Now, the first thing I have to say is two of our guests that have been advertised are unable to make it today. Flo Kennedy is facing a, uh, I mean, Flo Anthony, excuse me, revealing my age. Flo Anthony um, is facing a near-death situation for a member of her family and could not be here. Uh, and Guru uh, had a conflict in his schedule and was unable to come as he had originally planned. But we have today several fantastic people, including sitting immediately to my left, Vanessa Jones. Vanessa Jones is a graduate of Dartmouth College and Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. In 1999, she was hired by the Boston Globe to write about pop culture and lifestyles for the living arts section. She also writes profiles um, and concert and book reviews for the Globe. She is a native New Yorker and has worked for many newspapers and magazines, including the Hartford Current, the Memphis Commercial Appeal, the New York Daily News, the Asbury Park Press, and Newsweek. Immediately to her left, I'm sure you're all familiar with her, is Ananda Lewis. Um, she's a native of San Diego and graduated cum laude from Howard University with a BA in history. She is an award-winning television journalist who is currently the host of the Ananda Lewis Show, a talk show on King World CBS. She is well known for her work both on BET and MTV. At BET, Ananda hosted the top-rated Teen Summit, which explored issues such as teen parenting, date rape, and political activism. Her interview with Hillary Rodham Clinton won the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Youth Series. On MTV, she was the host of The Hot Zone, where she excelled as an interviewer and commenter on music style and issues of race and prejudice. After hosting the special True Life, I Am Driving While Black, she was awarded an NAACP Image Award. She has a long-standing record of commitment to social awareness and activism. <laughs> Immediately to her left is Larry Robinson. Larry Robinson is a president of Avatar Records, a Los Angeles-based EMI independent record company specializing in rap and soundtracks. He began as a producer remixer, and his credits include some, some very famous names in the music, Vanessa Williams, Prince, Shaba Ranks, Bobby Brown, and Whitney Houston. 
Lionel Richie, Duran Duran, The Coors, and Michael Jackson. In 1985, he established Avatar Publishing Group, a boutique black music publishing company that controls over 1,000 copyrights, including songs by Brandy, Tupac, Belle Div DeVoe, and Anita Baker. In 1994, he formed Avatar Records as a vehicle for rap, R&B, and soundtrack projects. Uh, the soundtrack to the HBO series Oz, featuring Snoop Dogg and Wu-Tang Clan, Clan, has been one of the best sellers. And immediately to, okay, oh, forgot to mention that he's, all, okay, no, I'm on the wrong page. Time for, time to, for his, on his left is Little X, who has been critically acclaimed for his innovative cinematic style and vivid imagination. Little X was named 2002's Hot Video Director by Rolling Stone magazine. He's currently directing videos for many top artists, including Usher, P. Diddy, and Nelly. He's also received many awards, inc including the Soul Train Award for Best Rap Video and the 2002 MTV Video Music Award for Best Male Video. He began his career at age 16 with an internship at Much Music, where he worked on shows such as Soul in the City and Rap City, and managed to get an internship with video director Hype William. He has also directed commercials for um, IKEA, Stomp, Noxzema, BET, Foot Locker, and several others. Let's welcome them all here today. Okay. okay, so let's get started. Everybody wants to know what you think. So why don't we start with one of these questions that um, the organizers of the Black Arts Festival were particularly wanted you to address. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> like, what do you think uh, ownership of a music genre means? Um, do you think a group can retain ownership of the musical form that is being predominantly performed, per perhaps very often performed by others? Anybody want to start? Anyone? Anyone? I'll go for it. I'll go for it. I'll put my foot okay. in my mouth first. Um, <laughs> I think with talking about black music and black people, we black people have been innovative with respect to music from day one. Back, uh, Louis Armstrong was innovative in how he played the trumpet, and he spoke through the trumpet with a, his vo a voice of his own, through Count Basie to Duke Ellington to Miles Davis. Nobody played the trumpet like Miles Davis before Miles Davis. So we've seen. And then, of course, Jimi Hendrix. Nobody played the guitar like Jimi Hendrix before Jimi, Jimi Hendrix. And nobody played a drum machine like the Bomb Squad before the Bomb Squad. <laughs> so I think, um, and you know, all the other producers and, you know, uh, uh, and rappers, uh, nobody kicks a verse like Rakim. So um, it's, from day one in history, we've seen black music be innovative. Now, we've also seen uh, other ethnic groups embrace the music because it's cool and hip and, 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 and the best shit going. So, uh, so uh, I don't have any problem with that. I think it's exciting that when you go to Japan, you have Japanese kids with their pants sagging, their hat on backwards, wearing a Wu-Tang Clan t-shirt, and dreads. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting that Jurassic 5 is huge in Scandinavia. or. Uh, when I was skiing in Switzerland, you know, and spoke to a 16-year-old kid who grew up in some small village in Switzerland, his favorite, he could barely speak English, but his favorite artist is KRS-One. That's exciting, you know, and, 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 and in France, you know, you drive down the Champs-Élysées and you're listening to the radio and it sounds like Hot 97 in New York because it's all rap all the time. That's exciting. The internationalization of, of the music is exciting. I don't have a problem with other nationalities. I put out a record one time and it's a rap record. You know, Master P's on it, you know, Corrupt and Nate Dogg, all these guys are on it. But it came out in Korea, so the Korean record company recorded two new songs by two Korean rappers rapping in Korean. Mm -hmm. And it was dope, too. I mean, it was like, gang, 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 gang. I was like, <laughs> it was dope. They could flow. So uh, that was cool. And I think the, the, the other ethnic groups embracing black music, there's no downside to that. What there is a downside to is when 
Black folks don't own anything in the United States, much less in the music business. We own very little. When I say own, I mean like own it. Own the masters, own the music publishing rights, own the distribution rights, own the TV stations, own the radio stations. We don't own too much. What I think is not cool is that we own so little, so the most of the economic benefit that comes from this music doesn't go to us. And in the year 2003, the fact that they're, that folks don't own the records and, you know, 50 Cent is huge, but guess what? He don't own those records. <laughs> Interscope Records, Universal owns those records. They're getting most of the profit. That's what the drag is yeah. to me. I think what's true in all the world's music, um, television, most of the creative outlets, you find people who are the creative people being owned and operated by people who have no creativity of their own. And so the <laughs> desire is always to put their stamp on what it is the other person um, should do. But I think the logical kind of, hello, hello, reasonable um, assumption that I make about, about who should own what or what is right when you talk about ownership um, is logically the person who created it kind of owns it. I mean, the copyright laws in the US pretty much state that if you create this original thing, by law, it's yours. And what comes along with that is that usage kind of demands what you're talking about, credit. Um, and some kind of compensation. We haven't found that to be true in the history, uh, in the cases of musicians that you've already mentioned. We haven't found that compensation or that credit due uh, being given. But I think more and more these days we really are because in any of the countries that you just spoke about being in, they wouldn't just say that's American, they would say that's black American. Mm -hmm. And they're clear on that. Mm -hmm. So the, the mm -hmm. credit in terms of idea and where it came from is there, but I don't think the compensation is. I agree with you on that. All right, so it's Im important to have both the credit and kind of reasonable economic I think right, it's more right than important. Share. I think it's kind of like your divine right as being a creator yes. of something. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so when you violate that, you're violating some kind of unwritten but agreed upon law that says, I made this and you can't take it from me unless I say you can. But if you're allowing it to be taken, then that's also partly your responsibility. Right. We're also dealing in, I have a saying that I say, is uh, be the credit maker, not the credit taker. Mm -hmm. This is our music. We've created it. No matter what you do, no matter how many Elvises dance around, no matter how many M&Ms come out, they will never be able to remove what this is. This is black music. Its source comes from black people, and the true source comes from Africa. It, it's, it's not really a discussion, and no one can deny that. And like you said, you go anywhere around the world, it can happen in America. They can pretend like Eminem created hip hop. They can have that fantasy and that dream and really, really hope that that's what happened. But anywhere else in the world you go, everyone understands what it is. It's music. It's made to be given. It's our gift. This is our gift that we were given from God, and it's our gift that we give to everyone else. And once it goes out there, it becomes an influence. And you can't own an influence. And really, it's a compliment when someone wants to do what you do. You know, and, and to, to run in and say, oh, it's ours. And not, it's not a discussion to have. We know it's ours. And just for the fact that you're trying to do it is a reaffirmation that it's ours. You know, so yeah, that's what it is to me. But I also think um, the issue of ownership can be limiting in some ways, because um, when you think of um, people like Lenny Kravitz or people who are trying to get into rock, if you're saying that um, black music can't be owned by other people, then you're saying that Lenny Kravitz can't do rock. And I think um, I black wonder Black folks that started rock and roll. To thank yeah. you for <laughs> taking the word that. Let's let her finish her statement. But, um, <laughs> but um, I just think in terms of um, the issues of ownership, that it sort of limits people people's um, ideas of what you can do and what you can strive for if you sort of try to grab everything and um, you know, just not let it go. But I do think um, I agree with everyone, what everyone said about um, you know, it is black music. I think it is well recognized, but I, I just um, fear that there's that other side where if um, you're pu we're putting limits on other people, then they're going to try to put limits on us. You, you have to let oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. A little less. You have to let things go. We build things and you let them go. You build a home and you let it go. We made rock and roll, we made jazz, we made all these things, and you let it go. So yeah, you, you're not coming across a lot of kids that want to play guitar or play trumpet and make jazz music. They want to make hip hop. They want to make R&B because that's what we've built right now. That is what we're building right now. And the day will come when these art forms, if the cycle continues, kind of leaves our hands and kind of just goes out into the universe and we make something new. And there's a new thing that young black kids want to make because it's ours. We've made it and we can let it go. And for the people that make rock music and make jazz music, regardless of the culture that they're from, love that music. So I, I, I can flip on both sides of, of that argument. There is no problem with an Eminem rapping 
because he loves hip hop. He's being true to the form of what that is. All, all, all these people. Then you get into the larger discussion about, well, why do the white artists make more money? Why do all those kinds of things? And then you begin to deal in, well, white people like seeing themselves. Black people like seeing themselves, and white people like seeing themselves do black music. It's a little reaffirmation. <laughs> we can do it too. We're, we're, you know what I'm saying? We're not completely out of that mix. Someone can dance like y'all. Someone can sing like y'all. We can hang in there a little bit. That's why they like their Justin Timberlakes and their Eminems and their, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and to be all honest, we love a white boy that can do it too. Because it's impressive. We, 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 you love it. We, you you said a white kid. Right, right, right. Okay. I got a white boy that will murder him. I got it. Oh, he's crazy. He's so ill. We, that's how we talk. We like seeing those things as well. There's always been some good interracial competition in the arts to keep everybody on top of their game. And, you know, there ha there, it's a, speaking of Eminem, there is, um, there's a respect that Eminem has from the hip hop community cuz he's dope. I mean, he's nice. I mean, you know, and there's a you know, there's a lot of white rappers that are trying to get on that aren't. And they're not going to get on. <laughs> and it makes them look even better. Right. <laughs> well, well, quite sure. like there's you know, there's a bunch of folks and there's an article in the LA Times 6 months ago talking about like five or six other white rappers that could not get the acclaim and the record sales and the and the, and, and, and the stardom that Eminem has because they are whack and 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 and, <laughs> and, and uh, 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 so there's a bona fide there's a real respect that Eminem has. On the other hand, probably in the first time in history, Eminem is signed to a black man's label, which is some new innovative new let's stuff. Talk, let's, talk <laughs> about, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about this issue, because I think one thing, thing that you guys are in the position to comment on that wasn't true in generations earlier, like in jazz history, if I'm thinking about jazz history in the 50s and the 60s, virtually everybody in the recording industry, all the producers, all the kind of music business people were white, and, and the leading artists were black. In, our, in the generation now, it seems like there's been such a movement to have uh, different artist-owned labels of people being active like all of you are in various aspects of the media, recording business, and publishing. What, what kind of effect do you think that, that greater presence has, has made of having um, African Americans in the music industry itself? What are the kind of accomplishments that you think have been made and what kind of problems do you still face? Mm, you know that best. Oh, well, I mean, that's my pet peeve. I mean, um, it's exciting. I think it's exciting that, you know, every kid in America, every black kid in America, wants to be Master P. They want. That's exciting to you? Yeah, I mean, in that. They want to open. Well, <laughs> now Master P's my man. Wow. And we are on television. No, no, but in, in, that, in that Master P. Not they don't want to perform like Master P, but they want to have a, everybody has a label. Now they could be 17 years old, live with their mama, but they got their own label. And they are thinking, in, well, when I was 17, I didn't think I wanted to have my own label. I just wanted to play music. But because of certain artists and the success of certain artists, uh, kids, younger adults are coming up saying, not only I want to perform, not only I want to make music, but I want to control my own destiny on the business side, which is new. So everybody you know, knows the story of Masterpiece starting to sell records out of the back of his car and parlayed that into a big, you know, huge, successful record company. Everybody wants to be Puffy. Everybody wants to be uh, Dr. Dre. And that is cool. I see kids, you know, uh, I call them kids because they're all, you know, 20 years old. Um, uh, have their own, and there are all these peripheral businesses in the record business. The fact that video directors have their own production companies, that's good. Uh, the fact that, you know, there's street promotion people all around the country, and they only, they're little entrepreneurs, and they have their little businesses, and they have two, three guys working with them to promote records, that's good. And they have their, and, and, and this entrepreneurship that's developing in the black community, in the music community, I don't see, and maybe I'm just ignorant, I don't see that too many places and too many other industries where there's this massive proliferation of magazines owned by black folks, you know, and it's, and, 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 and little companies and all that I think is, 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 is progress from where it had been several years ago where you performed, we own it. 
I think you're right when you're talking specifically about the music industry, but our history has taught us as African Americans that we have always risen above our challenges through entrepreneurship, through doing our own thing, through owning our own companies. My grandmother is a survivor of Greenwood and the Tulsa massacre that mm -hmm. occurred when Basically, there was a, a, an issue of jealousy and wanting to downplay and destroy what African Americans in Tulsa had created for themselves in terms of banks and ownership of stores, and many of you probably already know the story. But I, I, I only say that to say that the detail, the detail of it being the music business and of it being record labels and, and ownership of publishing is brand new. What is not new is the idea that our kids are going to emulate what we show them to emulate mm -hmm. and that they will aspire to what is put on a pedestal for them to aspire to. So the bar has changed kind of direction, but not level. I think we've always had that, that level of, of aspiration, but now it's about music. When it was about doctors and lawyers, and that was what you know your grandparents said is the only thing you could be to be anybody, that's what we all tried to be, and that's why many of our parents are in mm -hmm. those positions in, in life. So I don't think that's different. And I think what's scary about that imitation is um, what else is being put out there outside of the the image of, of record company ownership and, and all of the great things, there are a lot of really bad things that are coming along with that, that they're also imitating. And they don't get the sacrifice, they're not getting the rest of the truth that comes with it of the hard work and, and the real demand on your spirit right. in that sense. And then there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, uh, um, a lot of people think, that, you know, there's a lot of press about the, uh, the bling bling, the, the, the cars and all the jewelry the and, and all, all the accoutrements. <laughs> you know, and I've, I've seen, you know, there's a, a guy that I, I, I knew in, in Louisiana who thought having a business, he says, I have a record company. I said, okay, cool. And he says, you know, see this medallion encrusted with uh, rhinestones? That shows. I said, yeah, but do you have a bank account? He said, he said, no, I ain't got no bank account, but I got this dope medallion. You no, I don't no, have a house. I don't own anything, but I got this, you know, and I got a t-shirt, and I got this medallion, and I got a ring. And so, you know, we get some negative images. That's what images. I mean. Our priorities yeah. get all screwed up yeah. when all we see is the end effect and the success and the diamonds and the cars. Right. And we don't see what else we even need that right. we miss that step right. somehow. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that at least we're thinking as in the entertainment business, you know, all these guys that I know who are young directors, you know, want to make their own movies and want to raise their own money to make their movies and, and, and do their own thing. And they're not waiting for a, a Paramount Pictures or Warner Brothers or, 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 or MGM to give them money. They're just going to do it. And I love that spirit. You know, with that spirit, they also, you have to balance, you know, reality. Mm -hmm. But that spirit is something to be encouraged, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, the whole parts of the music and, and media business and publishing that are important in sort of creating a public image for the music. I'd like to ask, ask Vanessa specifically how she views the role of, of criticism and, um, and journalism in presenting um, African American music um, in the newspapers. I remember being a student at New England Conservatory about 20 years ago, and I don't remember anybody African American writing any cultural columns in the in the in the Globe at that time. And I'm wondering, is there a change in uh, sensibility of the appropriateness of writing on these topics now, or do you, do you still have to be careful about what you what topics you choose? Um, well, I'm not sure what your question is in terms of. Um, I don't know if you mean the coverage in the Globe in terms of black music, or you're talking about the tone of these stories. Oh, I'm talking. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask you just how you feel as a journalist working for a newspaper. If you, if you, what, what, what you view your role um, um, in covering the materials. Yeah. Um, well, basically, um, it's pretty open in terms of um, if you have an interest in something, you're pretty much able to, you know, cover those um, whatever the concert is. I do mostly a lot of hip hop and R&B because that's what my interest is. So. Um, but I know in the past, before I came there, the, the Globe didn't really cover that much hip hop and R&B, so I guess there has been a change in that way. Although they do have um, writers who um, covered hip hop, but um, yeah, in that in that way, it is a bit you know different in terms of changes of what's happening and how things are covered. Do you feel an obligation to um, you know support various uh, artists that you choose to write about, or um, do you mean me personally, or well, you're trying to uh, you know? There's always this issue of criticism, of, of positive or negative, and um, the, the role that uh, coverage can have uh, on career. Well, if I don't like something else, I'll 
say it or I won't do it. Uh -huh. But um, <laughs> no, I try to be honest and I think that helps, and in some ways that helps people. And I, I think it's also unfair if you're saying, oh, well, if it's a black person, I'm not gonna say anything negative about them. That's kind of racist, actually. <laughs> so um, I would never do that. Um, no. Mm -hmm. I'm also curious about video. And um, I remember um, MTV, as I recall, when MTV started, they didn't want any black music on MTV. That the, the market they had access to, and I wasn't there when they started, so I shouldn't speak for them on that. But I, I know that there was this, I mean, just widespread kind of demand for for rock, you know, for that was like the target white stuff and stuff in '81. So I think as the music industry started transitioning, MTV's mm -hmm. what, what they aired started transitioning as well. Did you see any changes in programming over the time you were at um, MTV? Yeah, and those changes kind of also followed um, the, the music business. But I, I also noticed this change in kind of consciousness in, in, within um, young people at the time. And so um, things like Columbine were happening, and MTV being this mainstay for Generation Next, uh, or whatever you want to call us, um, kind of had to rise to that occasion and, and meet those things head on. So we ended up doing a lot of forums, a lot of programming, and a lot of things off air that really had to do with helping young people talk about the issues of violence and, mm -hmm. and um, anger management that kind of fed into the, the violence we were seeing in schools. And I think the same thing is happening now in the, the face of, of war, that young people are concerned about that, and so MTV you know, gears some programming toward it. Now, the entire station isn't gonna change because of it. I think their mainstay will always be music. That's what mm -hmm. we are as a music television network. Um, but even music reflects current event and kind of social r relevant ideas and lyrics and what have you. So they absolutely follow that. A little X, do you have anything to um, to say about like the whole visual thing on MTV and the way in which a video presentation complements um, you know the visibility of, of black music and, and the kinds of things you think about as you're making uh, making decisions about how a video really goes. <laughs> and why are those girls naked? <laughs> Thank you, Larry. In other words, <laughs> I just said, I said it all. Right. Jump off, X. Jump off. Jump off. Here we go. Here we go. Just start a conversation, go. brother. Got into this at lunch, okay? Yeah. okay. Well, right. You know, the, the music has made a change. When I first, when I came into the business, mm -hmm. I was an intern. I worked for Hype uh, Williams. I was an intern for him. And at the time, like the first few videos I made, uh, we did "Hello, Cool J." Hey, Lover. He had done "California Dream." We did, so it was, and he was known, he did Montel Jordan, All About the Honeys. He was the guy who kind of did the girl videos, and he did them in such a way, and that's what we came under. And I remember there was a big shift when we did Big Pimpin'. Hmm. That was, <laughs> the, the Jay-Z, we went to Trinidad. I went to Trinidad. I sent me to a vacation in Trinidad. I, I went to Trinidad and, mm -hmm. for New Year's and saw my family, went nuts and said, money, you got to see what's going on out here. So we said, cool, we're going to do Jay-Z. A carnival. Oh my so God. we went out to carnival. We do a song <laughs> called Big Pimp, and they spent a million dollars on it. And there was always been, he'd always been that guy who did the girl videos. But for some reason, this one just hit people. It hit everybody like, oh, you guys remember Big Pimpin', right? <laughs> everybody yeah. was just like, what, what is, yo, what, <laughs> what? And everyone just looked at their TV, and it clicked in everyone's minds. All the executives, all the rappers, all the directors, if I put a bunch of women next to my artist on a boat, anywhere, <laughs> and they will pay anywhere. attention. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it just became all, everything. Just the, the, a flood of, of these videos came through the industry. Everybody. I, and then that was around the time that I myself was directing. Right? So the, now I got pulled into the mix. So we're all just shooting these videos where songs are coming out. Around that time, I shot Shake Your Ass. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Remember Shake Your Ass? Yeah. I'm, I'm, hey, I did, I, did, I did my booty video. So, I was talking to all of them. I'm like, this yeah. is Shake Your Ass. This is Shake Your Ass. But so <laughs> I'm even, I remember, I, and I looked at my notes while I was making this not long ago, and I even wrote while I was doing it, like, I'm tired of doing these girl videos, but this is what the music that's coming to you. So how my challenge became for myself, how can I make this intelligent? How can I, how can I do this obviously sexual song but mm -hmm. still not make it just 
you know, mm -hmm. booty shaking, but it's still booty shaking. So <laughs> I went and I you got. Still diamonds onto the thong. <laughs> <laughs> but, but hold on. But you got it. Yeah. To, to a degree, we, I had to. I had to bring it up I, a level. I got to bring it up. Money. A level. I, I went and took. I went and saw Eyes Wide Shut. Uh -huh. You remember Eyes yeah. Wide Shut, the Stanley Kubrick film? And I took the Eyes Wide Shut theme and I applied this to this music video. I, I said, okay, we're going to take this and recreate this. And no, it's not a, a, a perfect. You know, this is by far not the most equal level. The song's called Shake Your Ass. <laughs> it is okay. what it is. It is what it is. But I've got to make a video for it. I, I want to. I want to direct. I want to make the. I want to make something. But I want to make it look good. I want to make this look like photography. So I went and took Eyes Wide Shut, and I took those two things, and I kind of merged them together, and it, it was my my challenge to kind of make these things smart. Not every time do we meet that mark, because I've, I've, I'm your workman as a director. A lot of us get caught up into a system. So you come to me with a song, you're going to be on television. Your face is going to be singing the song and wearing the clothes, and you're the first name that goes down the list of credits. Mm -hmm. So I've done the videos where they come and say, let's do a bunch of girls. And all I want to do is girls. I don't care about nothing, but I just want to do a bunch of girls. And I said, OK. <laughs> and, and, and almost my reaction to it, well, I, I did Danger. And we said at lunchtime, the, the Mystical Danger video never should have been on television any time before 12 a.m. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but they played it on 106 and Park, which is prime time children's teenage marketing time. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? And I mean, it was raw dog. Like, if, if, they put, if I was 15 and Danger was on television, boy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, <laughs> And, but the, the, this Correct. is it, we we ran we ran and we ran and we started getting through these things and we we ran the spectrum of really horrible badly done booty videos and I don't know if it's a, a plus or minus to do a really glossy music video in that kind of way and we get into the we get into we get into the, the discussions about it isn't exactly the same thing because you can feel quality without even acknowledging it consciously. Well, so we came, we got, we got into a discussion we about where is to it before though and have something to identify it right. in we, relationship to. You get into your bigger discussion about where's the diversity. Because Mystical is a grown man. And if he wants to make a song called Shaky Ass, he can. And as grown men, there should be, in making a video for it, there should be something that we can see and say, OK, cool. But there is nothing to counter, there is no balance to it. Because here I am, I might be making my eyes wide shut, and I might be trying to make my, my video as intelligent as I can. But at the same time, this is going on the air, sandwiched in between mm -hmm. just the videos with the guys saying, hey, get the girls and put them in the thing, and da, da, da. And so in the flow of programming, <clears throat> this one little bit that might look good doesn't really make that much of a, a difference or a dent. I've got to do what I can do for me. But I still, then when I step back and I acknowledge that, and a, a point came for me when I said, yo, what am I, when a little girl, here's the one where I really, had to stop. I'm in Toronto and I'm sitting in the basement of my friend's place and you know I'm, I've left the matrix of New York for a minute and I'm with the people I grew up with. I'm in the area I grew up with and we're downstairs with the TV on top of the crate and you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and this girl comes up to me and she's maybe eight years old and she, she leans on my leg and she goes, DANGER! <laughs> And not beyond that, not only did you see that video, you knew I did it. Uh, what are we doing? And I turn on MTV and I see kids, the teenage girls kissing girls on Dismissed and what you're going to, um, and I'm like, well, we, we live in a cocoon just like the rappers. I, I put, up my, my, put up my little bubble of defense and I said, well, you know, I'm making images and it's what the music says and it's just this and it's just that and, you know, I'm not responsible and your kids and all that, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, but hold on, what really? What really do I do? What, what, what influence does my work have? And what am, these images that kids see, really, you learn from either seeing it, hearing it, or doing it. And on television, becomes it's a much more powerful tool because you see it and hear it at the same time and believe that you've experienced it. You think you can handle that. You somehow think you've seen someone get shot. You somehow think you've done all these things. And it has a much deeper effect. So, as time goes on, I, I began to do videos less and less in that way. Like now, I'm not interested in doing a party video. And if you see a party video that I do, there's nowhere near the same kind of shots that I might have done. The dancing, the wardrobe, things have changed in the way I approach things. That's how I have to approach things. That's how I, I'm, and I'm growing up. I was 24. 
Mm -hmm. I was you wanted to see some booty videos. <laughs> you can tell it, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, but look, you know, there's the a part whole... I have about this. Let me just add that not only all of the things that Little X said are, are kind of karmic ramifications of that, but also that little eight-year-old girl maybe not having another image in her home or exactly. somewhere else of what women should be are, is not only saying, oh, I want a party like that, but that's the kind of woman I have to be to get that kind of attention. And so that's where I think people who have a major issue with it and there's, there's have a, a major issue. There's a whole history around this, too. I mean, um, we talked about this some at lunch, too, that, that, that racism is, has historically been so sexualized. Um, I, I've had occasion to talk to some African Americans of probably your parents or grandparents' generation who feel very ambivalent about some of the kind of images um, of violence and, and sex in, in some of um, uh, the videos. And it's, uh, do, do you see a, a, any kinds of problems in terms of the, the industry pushing you to play into certain kinds of stereotypes around that, or um, how do you try to work around that? Mm -hmm. It's changed now. You, mm -hmm. you, even though those sexual images are still there, I, back when, in that in the year 2000 when we were making the big pimpins and we were doing thong song was a massive song and you know and not just for us. I, mean, I did the thong song remix. I told you. I've, <laughs> I, um, and, and and don't forget beyond just beyond just black culture being extremely sexual at that time. Culture, the whole Western culture itself was extremely sexual. We sometimes forget that we're part of a larger world. So everyone was running full head, full long into just this crazy sexed out world. And people would definitely come and say that we want girls, we want girls, we want them in this, we want them in that. Again, the danger video is an example of that. The, um, I did the Fiesta remix video. Uh, it was saying, we want girls, we want girls. It's, we want, they didn't care really what it was, it's just girls. It was, all, it was, was just the, was just the, the, the topic of the day. Now, it's still a discussion. Maybe I don't have it as much because people know I'm not interested in still making those kinds of videos. But BET had such a hard time when I speak to their programming directors about people saying, I can't, I can't let my kids watch television. We're not gonna play these kinds of things. The type of edits that they brought back to us mm -hmm. after we started making videos, take out this shot, take out that shot, take out this shot, take out this shot. And videos would almost get completely recut once they took in the BET, did what they could to really start changing things around. You know, everyone's going to go through their time. Everyone's going to go through their... White music itself went through a very sexual period in the 1980s with the glam rock and all those kinds of things. It's almost like, and it's just almost like puberty that they had to go through and hit another mark and maybe become a little bit more intelligent about it. Sex is always going to be around. Mm -hmm. Sex will always sell. But how we sell those images and how we put those images out into the larger culture are things that I believe just need to become more intelligent and more honest. And... Um, and, and things along those lines. So now when you're doing a video, you're gonna see, I'll bring up Sean Paul. The two Sean Paul videos that we did where it's still women dancing, still guys dancing, everyone looks sexy, but dance itself is a sexual act beyond, beyond all this other stuff, just dancing. So when you put a girl in some jeans and a tight top and a hat and she's doing dance steps, she's not gyrating the way we used to do it, like just dance sexy for us, but she's doing a dance routine. There's something sexy about it, but it doesn't feel dirty. It doesn't feel insulting. Because it's what? choreographed. Because it's choreographed. It's choreographed. But it's, but it's, okay, it's no, dance. No, it's no, dance. No. When you put the guys in a dance routine, like you're never, ever, and beyond that, let's get really, really honest. White women in their bikinis on Baywatch and the type of sexuality that they sell and the way they sell it, and black women, you remember the, the, the essence of fertility is the black woman's sculpture in Africa. This is, this is what it's about, the mother of the planet Earth. And when you put the mother of the planet Earth in some clothes and tell her to dance, there's a whole new effect that it has on people watching television. You know what I'm saying? So uh, th those are all these underlying things that happen when we just put now, the camera now the good on news, and do it. The good news is that some, I think music, like everything, goes in trends. And like I said at lunch, the only thing constant about the music business is change. And so I think we go through periods where, I don't know, in the early 80s, no, early 90s, you know, you had X-Clan, which was, you know, y'all hip to X-Clan, right? You know about X-Clan. Kids, <laughs> kids looked at me like, who's X-Clan? X-Clan was a very political group, public enemy, very political. Then the politics went out of the music, and it got into more some, you know, into more gangster-oriented stuff. You know, you had the N.W.A., the Dre, the Snoop stuff. Then that kind of played out, and uh, you know, 
know, music goes through changes. Now, I mean, you have artists like Common and, and, and Most Deaf and Talib Kweli and uh, uh, The Roots who are more socially conscious, uh, who are very popular. You know, one thing about the record business and one thing about record companies is, is that they'll sell anything that sells. In other words, if, if, if all the people across America and around the world started buying, you know, country western records with black people. There ain't no black people making country western records, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, <laughs> but if all of a sudden there was a couple of pub, pub, uh, country western artists that were black, they're popular, record companies would just sign a mass of black country western singers. But that whatever starts selling, record companies are like sheep. They'll go this way, they'll go that way. It doesn't matter really to them which way they'll go as long as there's, there's, there's a sale there. My, That's like movie companies and everybody mm -hmm. and anything else. My other problem with the, the video element um, is, is in comparison to like a Baywatch or a film where people, women, are kind of in bikinis and all of that. Both of those two other vehicles allow a woman to actually say something. Now, if she sounds like an idiot, that's one thing. If she sounds like, you know, intelligent, it's another. But she's saying something. She's using more than just her body. And I have never had a problem with what the women have on necessarily. Because, I mean, you know, I dress however I want. And I think <laughs> if you're grown, you should do what you want to do. I have no problem with how people choose to portray themselves. My problem comes in where shots are taken just of like from the neck down and, and just of like someone's at butt or <laughs> yes, just of these two guys, you know, with these 50 women around them and the relationship that it shows of these women, I mean, of these men just kind of using the women as scenery and as kind of like something to be cast aside or something to, you know, be pouring champagne over someone's head is like, if they, if they could speak in a video, which, you know, we're talking three minutes of music, I know that's not the, the, the genre for that, but if that were the case, then my issue would be different. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that we're just showing visuals and these visuals are saying so much and there's no balance to that. Now, at the same time those videos were out, were out we had the balance of like a Lauryn Hill um, with doo -wop. We had the miseducation of Lauryn Hill out, you know, five, eight Grammys, whatever. And so there is that balance, but we didn't get Lauryn Hill's video played as much as we got. Right. Mexico's yeah. video play. Right. So again, it's the balance and it's what the video is saying and, and how the women are being portrayed, not necessarily just what they're wearing. And I also want to get okay. into um, back to the little ex's, um, the second Sean Paul video, because someone uh, mentioned it to me, the fact that, um, you know, skin color is also an issue in these videos. And the thing with, about the Sean Paul video is that the, um, the woman, the lead woman, was a dark-skinned woman. And that was unusual for a lot of these videos. And um, a lot of people comment upon it. Well, they've, they've come. That's, that's been. And she had short hair. <laughs> you know, we need to move into the question and answer part with the audience. Really? Um, and I'd like those of you who would like to ask a question uh -oh. to line up at the mics. And I'd uh -oh. like you to, to ask you to be very brief and really just ask a question, not make a really long comment so as many people can can ask as possible. And and state and would you mind stating your name when, before you ask your question? Yes, Go ahead. Uh, my name is Omar Abdul Malik. I'm a graduate of the uh, Kennedy School. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year I'm uh, writing a book on the influence of uh, Islam on American culture. And uh, I want to ask a general question to the panel. Um, what is the influence that you see of Islam in uh, hip hop music and is hip hop culture? And do you see it as a positive? I, I, I'm not too qualified to answer that question, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Uh, <laughs> when did intelligence ever stop me? Um, uh, I think, um, I think uh, hip hop musicians are interested in Islam to a degree, uh, especially on the kind of quote unquote progressive wing. Uh, you have, I'm sorry, you have. Um, artists in the kind of common Talib Kweli, most deaf genre that are at least on the surface kind of superficially embracing Islam. Again, I'm, I'm not Islamic. Uh, I don't know the depth of their understanding of Islam, the religion of the culture or whatever, but I see there is, you know, some kind of superficial or peripheral 
influence that Islam has on like the progressive hip hop guys. And I I'm think the, for a while it was trendy, and so it was cool for people to say, I'm, I'm Muslim or I'm Islamic, and and go to like Farrakhan rallies, but they still had naked girls in their videos. So right. I don't know what impact it had on their moral kind of, you know. <laughs> they like the good parts. Election like the, perspective, but right. yeah. But it, I, I found the real influence. My, my name is Little X. If you know what I'm saying. Yeah. If that gives you any influence <laughs> off of the nation, the nation of Islam and. And um, that time when X Clan was around, and Malcolm X photos, and Mar Marcus Garvey pictures, and Martin Luther King, and all these images were being shot at us the way right now girls are being shot at us. It gave my generation some kind of pride. We identified with something. We began to understand. Okay, we have a history. We have a role here. Everyone was much more uh, politically conscious in school. There's a lot. We have black student organizations, and it really did have an effect. As the world outside us began to change and people adapt to their environment, we did as well. But I, you can't really remove what's been implanted in people, right? And I think that's some, what sometimes we forget. Deep inside and saw it, all these rappers and my generation is still that seed that was planted back in the early 90s of black consciousness in Africa and all, and all these things. We've forgotten about it. No one's really watered it or taken care of that tree, and it feels like it's died to everyone. And the younger generation hasn't received that, but it's still there. There's still something there. It's just a matter of someone coming in and pouring the water and kind of nursing it back to health. I'd like to ask the next, next question over, over here. Thank you. My name is Michael Fernandez. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is for the panel is, can you comment on how music impacted you during your childhood? And as you reflect on this, what role do you feel you play in music education today? Mm, I'm going to let uh, Ananda <laughs> uh, The first thing that came to my mind when you said that was, in, in high school, you said um, president of our BSUs and stuff. I was president and founder of my BSU in high school. Um, and, and it was because of not just music, but I mean the people in my environment too, who were very conscious and kind of proactive, and you know, gave me that. But the music definitely helped. I mean, it reinforced what I already knew, and it popularized it to the point where I felt comfortable expressing that and sharing that. Um, so, and within that, the original story I was thinking of was. Um, Roberta Flack, 1968, before I was even born, her album, First Take, one of my favorite songs compared to what, which has been slaughtered in a remake recently, <laughs> um, <laughs> was like my anthem at the time. And, and I remember the lyrics and I remember how kind of empowered they made me feel. And I remember, you know, getting very, um, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for, the whole militant, you know, vibe. I remember wearing like the public enemy, uh, little thing on the leather <laughs> rope that you can get for four dollars, and, <laughs> uh, and the Africa symbols, and red, black, and green, and and that carried with me, or it allowed me to to kind of embrace this sense of empowerment, not just as a young African American person, but as a young African American woman, and. And at the time, I'd gotten way into like Farrakhan rallies. All the things I, was, things I was talking about, those were very real for me. And coming into this industry in particular, I think it helped me because not only did it give me a base from which to feel like I could fight, but it gave me ammunition and kind of knowledge about what I'm talking about to be able to fight it. And my favorite part of the story is in 99, on November 19th, I will never forget this day, Roberta Flack had a concert at the Blue Note in New York and invited me to come on stage and sing that song with oh her. Oh, my God. Robert. And I did. I was scared. <laughs> but it was good. Can't miss an opportunity like that. And it was, and even now, I remember, you know, every lyric, and she didn't even remember the song. So even she didn't know the kind of, she didn't. She was like, how'd that go again? <laughs> good look. You know, the, Her first, impact. the first record, now I'm going to date myself, show you yeah, just okay. how old I am. Sorry. The first record I ever actually went and bought, and it was on my sister's record player, and you came down, it was, they had record players then, it was like black little plastic, and they put the thing on there, and they went round and around. <laughs> and it had a big hole in the middle, they were called 45. Needle. It was a needle. It was, it was like around the same time as the stagecoach. <laughs> um, the first record I bought was Edwin Starr. Stop the War, now. It was a great record, it was a great record. And it was, you know, it was 1962. No, no, it was um, <laughs> like 71 or something like that, I think. Wow. Jesus. So, um, 
you know, by the time I grew up, it was, you know, the, uh, you know, the Black Panthers were happening, the US organization, SDS, you know, kids were taking over, you know, administration buildings on college campuses, women's movement was in full bloom, uh, you know, folks were defending the right for, of Jane Fonda to go to Hanoi, I mean, it was a totally different time. Well, actually, not so totally different, you know, there's a lot of uh, similarities to what's going on now. Uh, so when I went and bought that record, it was very influential. A lot of the stuff I do now, how does that relate to what I do now? A lot of the stuff I try to do now, and that's why I don't sell too many records, <laughs> is do more progressive stuff. I mean, I'm, I, I did a record I'm very proud of that nobody, none of y'all bought, was uh, the rap companion album to a film called Panther that was called Pump Your Fist. And it, um, mm. it featured the Fugees before they were big, mm -hmm. Tupac, Karis One, uh, Chuck D, and it was a very politically progressive album. It was dull. And um, <laughs> Jay Rue the Damager. And, um, mm. and we gave $10,000. You know, one of the things that we try to do is try to align uh, whatever project we're doing to some kind of charity that makes sense. So in the case of that record, we gave $10,000 to the uh, uh, Committee to Free Geronimo Pratt. And, uh, you know, gave him the money. You know, I was like, where are we gonna get this money from? So gave him the money, and you know, six months later, Geronimo Pratt got out of jail, and you know, his people said, you know, you don't know how influential that money was, because that was real, because we had to, you know, file motions to, you know, and, and, and I'm very proud of that. And on another record, we, we gave a bunch of money to uh, the Innocence Project, which is a, a group that gets wrongly convicted prisoners off of death row. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and you know, I think there's, so in other words, I'm always trying to figure out a way to do something with the music that is A, entertaining, B, educational and progressive and doing something. Okay, let's have our next question from up there. Hi, my name is Eric Daz. I'm a first year student here at the Kennedy School. Um, and whew, I'd like to go back to the issue of ownership and control. And I think that's a big reason why a lot of us are here. And I think we can all agree that there's very little control over the imagery of black people, including black women, on regular network TV. You don't see black people on Friends, you know, shows like that. But you do see black people, black women especially, in music videos, and that's a genre that people of color do have more control over the imagery. So it's upsetting to me as a black woman that, that this is the image that's being put out there a lot of the time, and that's really the only image that people of all races in this country do see a black woman on television. And I don't think we need Bill O'Reilly to tell us that, and we don't need Tipper Gore to tell us that. So at what point as a community can we say, we need to take responsibility, responsibility for this ownership that we do have of our image that's, that's putting out there? The real responsibility is to understand that the TV is not what you think it is. It's just the television. Understand that it's just a little box where images get pumped because when you do make videos, we did a video of Boys to Men. I don't know if you, any of you ever saw this, just like your records that never mm -hmm. sold. Mm -hmm. here's, my, here's my video that never got played. So, Hype Williams, Chris Robinson, Benny Boom, Little X, all right, the four biggest music video directors in the game, take each a member of Boys to Men and travel around the globe. Benny Boom went to Ghana. Hype Williams went to Japan. I went they to remember India. That. They remember it. You remember it. You're the few. Right? <laughs> you went, went to India. Chris Robinson went to Puerto Rico. And at the end of the video, this is post September 11th. At the end of the video, each guy walks around these beautiful countries on their own. You're seeing people from all over the world, and then at the end, they come to New York City together, and they all join together, and they meet on the New, Jer New Jersey side of the river and look across at the beams of light that was the memorial for September 11th. On so many levels, this video should have been played. On so many levels, people should have taken this up and said, this is it. This is what we want to see on television. And they didn't. And they never played it. And you saw it maybe if you're up at 2 o'clock in the morning. When, when they should have been playing the mystical video, that's when they played this Boys and Men video. So, you know, and, and that was all of us. I, I, I can't even say how it feels for those kinds of things to go down, but that's the industry that we're in. And on a larger picture, again, let's take a, another look outside the black community. They're protesting all over in America and all over the world about the war we're about to have. But when you turn on your evening news, you don't see those things, okay? So, you know, we want to change the way our music videos look, and we want this, 
this box that we put so much weight on is just a tiny box. And if you step back and look at the bigger picture, you'll see our world. You'll see what's really happening in your world. It's just a box. It's just a little thing that you have the power to turn off. But we don't And think I agree about with that. that. And at the same time, we know the reality that as small and little as that box is, millions upon billions of young minds are looking at it and using it as their education. Because family has broken down, because community mm -hmm. has broken down, because whatever, mm -hmm. church, religion, whatever you, has broken down. So that is where people People go to look to find and the problem is that it, it you were saying this before before y'all were here it's so controlled the, the hand that is on it is, is gripped so tightly around it that it's very difficult to get in other voices voices of dissent don't have a chance because they don't want to hear that and I think they they the big whoever the big they is we always refer to learned from the population of people that protested against the Vietnam War and were doing all the things you, you remember the music representing you know the fight um, um, and said, we're going to dumb down those people now. Because one, they have too much energy because they're young. They have too much to say. They're too able to get out and do things. And they control too much money for them not to be on our side. So if they can't be on our side, we're just not going to let them know anything. We're just going to entertain them. Part of that is our fault for allowing ourselves to just be entertained. You have a responsibility to that. You know, because you are responsible for whatever you take into your life, what you learn, what you do with it. That's all on you. But the other responsibility absolutely lies in the laps of the people who control that entity because it is what's teaching especially our generation but even more than that the people right under us so if we can kind of jump ahead and use some hindsight because you can imagine what's going to happen to little kids right now if we keep going in this direction then all of us need to choose to do something about how they're being educated mm -hmm. and how much TV they're watching and what it is that's on the TV when they're watching it we all have little kids in our lives you know and so on some level, that little bit of, you know, each one teach one, each one reach one, one, each one bring one into the sun is very true. That if you just impact your immediate circle, then that circle is impacted. And you don't have to worry about a larger hand kind of coming in and, and pulling them out or putting something in that you don't want there. So I think your responsibility can begin there. But X, you were also talking before about, and you were talking about this too, Larry, kind of collaborating, especially as African American women, if we're really sick of that image, making that known. I mean, it, it's one thing to say it here, it's another thing to get 25,000 signatures and send it to the head of Sony Music or the head of MTV or the head of BET, which are now the same person, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, I mean, and, and therein lies your power, that quality, that spirit of kind of revolution and organizing that we had in the 60s and early 70s has kind of dwindled away. We've become so individualized that we don't get that. We really do make more noise as a collective group of people. So I would start there if and you're really I, sick of it. I, I, I really am, am, am sensitive to what you say because I'm a heterosexual, red-blooded American man and I'm offended by all the TNA on TV. So that that's, so shows you how a lot. That's, that shows you how crazy it's gotten. But guess what? It's up to us. It's up to us and up to y'all, because you get the entertainment you want. You know, and like Ananda said, at some point it's going to get to the point where I grew up in my generation. We burned stuff down. If we didn't like it, we burned it down. We protested, we marched, we burned it down. We're not telling you to burn things down, though. <laughs> exactly, especially on television. Don't burn, burn especially when they're playing my video. But, um, <laughs> uh, but no, I'm serious. If this has reached a level where it is really offensive to you, then it's incumbent upon you and your friends to organize, 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 and protest and write letters to Mar Mel Carmazan and uh, what's his name, Sumner Redstone, and say this is unacceptable, no, and, 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 and protest, and make so much noise that they say, you know what, we're going to issue an edict that you can't have, you can have four women in bikinis, but 17 is too much, you know. And, and, and One I, woman per guy per video, right, okay? Right, Let's right, right. with the reality right. of relationship. <laughs> okay, I've gotten a note that says, unfortunately, we have to begin cutting it shortly. And I'd like to ask to come up at this time the uh, director of the Black Ar Arts Festival question. to close out our event Whoa. for us. Uh, <laughs> we had a time like that. <laughs> watch on. And in the meantime, two, we do have time for two more questions. All right. Okay. Okay, I'll keep it short. Okay. My question, way up there. Oh. My question is. We'll get you, you. You can be the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm Michelle Simpson from the law school, and went to Howard University. Hey, you. <laughs> um, 
And my question is, a lot of times African Americans forget, and I think other cultures don't even realize that not only did the music and hip hop as a culture, meaning the dance, the style of clothing, everything, begin in the black community, but it began in the worst of the black community. And a lot of these things and these dances that we're doing were done in projects all over the country like ye five years ago. And I wanted to know if you all, um, have any thoughts on how we can not only highlight this is black music, but a lot of these original thoughts are from the poorest of the black people and they get no credit. Well, I'm actually, um, there was a story that I just did a couple of months ago about um, hip hop looking back at, um, I guess its origins, and that was one of the things that everyone talked about, it was where hip hop came from and the fact that it did come from the Bronx, you know, it's the, um, you know, one of the, at that time in the 70s, one of the most blighted um, areas of um, New York City. And um, that it was the fact that, um, how it was the influence of the fact that, um, the fact that actually these kids were, you know, basically, it, they were, well basically it was the people who had, um, had their parents were in Vietnam and their fathers were in Vietnam and they sort of had um, sort of the beginning of um, a lot of issues that were coming into, in, you, you basically got into in the 80s and 90s in terms of um, one parent families and um, issues of um, the parent, the single mother working and what do these kids do when they're home and so um, I think those issues do get out sometimes but sometimes they get lost, people don't really care about that, they want to hear about certain issues that, um, you know, they want to hear about the bling bling, they want to hear about the naked women, they want to hear about certain things, and, um, but you do try to get those issues in. Can I just say real quick that we also have to remember that school has not traditionally been the place we've been best educated ever, and especially now. <clears throat> And, and so as African American people, we really have taken it upon ourselves throughout, throughout history to, to show and, and, and tell our children what we needed them to know, the real kind of facts about life. And I think in terms of our history, that needs to begin to happen again, begin, uh, needs to begin to happen more. And to, wherever the young lady went, fighting for vehicles that we can do that through as well. BET has been sold, and it, it wasn't all that B in the ET before it was sold, and especially <laughs> isn't going to be now. So I think it's important to demand an outlet. To be able to have a voice, you have to be able to be heard through something, and we don't have that anymore. Our news is going away. All the things that would really report on what is happening with us and what has happened with us are kind of dying out. So I think that's an important focus um, as well. And understand people are struggling and trying and, and you know, walking out of places where you can't get it right. Last question from up there. Oh man, what the, the pressure is great. Okay, my name is Neil, um, and I'm a, I'm a sophomore at Harvard. Um, and my question has to do with um, a couple things. For me, maybe this is just my idealistic idea, but what inspires me a lot about hip hop is that um, it has incredible um, potential for everyone being a creator, you know, like communities and, 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 and each person, you know, recognizing what's good about them and, and trying to do that. Um, you know, throwing something up on a wall or, or dancing on the sidewalk. And it seems like a lot of the trends in hip hop today, I know you're talking about entrepreneurship is up, but it seems like a lot of the trends are the reverse and seem like they, they, they're stifling creativity. If you look at like um, the, the corporate ownership of hip hop and you know, Island Def Jam just made a deal with Hewlett Packard. There's, Jay-Z is, you know, um, plugging his new vodka. It's, it's, all, it's all about a relationship of, of um, <laughs> consumer, a passive I consumer. It seems like good. a lot more and more hip hop is about um, watching TV and buying the right things and, and buying the right records and, and being a passive consumer rather, th rather than these this spontaneous um, creative potential. And I was wondering if you guys see that or if I'm just a crazy person who doesn't know what he's talking about. You're not crazy. It's really happening. <laughs> I mean, you know. Is there anything um, we can do about that? In, uh, capitalism see, where do you see that? is taking over hip hop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the, the hip hop is a business just like everything else. Uh, it's very hard to get your records out there. Um, I'm trying to do a uh, marketing partnership right now with Xbox. To, for them to sponsor something of mine. Why? Because a little company like mine doesn't have the money to put on a tour with uh, Jurassic 5, Dilated People's Most Deaf, and the other artists that I have. So who does? Microsoft has 48 billion in the bank. So you know, if I can get a couple hundred thousand, please, straight. Uh, I'll be straight. Um, so you know, that's one aspect of it. You know, uh, uh, music people align themselves with. Uh, corporations to bring more marketing bang for their buck so that their music can get out there. But then there's another wing of, of hip hop that is totally uh, against that. And again, you get the music you want. If you really want Little Brother, go buy it. And he'll, you know, they will, you know, 
their record will be successful and it won't be underground anymore. But you know, everybody talks about, well, I only like underground this. I only like um, neo soul this. I only like jazz. Y'all ain't buying it, <laughs> you, know? you know? The folks that like Ja Rule, they're buying it. You know, the folks that like the bling bling stuff, they're buying it. I try to inspire people to find out what's different, find out what's creative, find out what might not be in the mainstream and go over to the uh, off the beaten path a little bit, but support it, because if you don't support it, it will go away. You know? access, and you have, right? to, you, you have to search for it. You have to search for it. I've been looking for fertile ground, the group out of DC for like, eight months, and you can't even buy them online on their own website. So, I mean, you really do have to search for it, and the access is part of the problem. Another, but I read an interview with Mr. Liff recently, you know, the Boston MC. Of course, yeah. His big thing, he, he can't figure out why, black, why it's all, all white kids at his shows. That's another problem, like the underground. They love the Who culture. Say we, we don't. Love the culture. Oh. He, I, he, I was thinking that, that we create this culture, but I, we create our culture right. every day, but I don't know if we love our culture. And then again, we get into the topic of do we love ourselves. Mm -hmm. but, but also, you, we're a very kind of free people and always have been in, in spirit, and I think there's this tendency to kind of, I think Europeans have always kind of represented more of a stifling quality, this kind of strict and stern, and I think all of us are sick of that. I think, you know, white or black or otherwise, you want to be free, and maybe that's what you were referring to before, and since you see something that is free, it's natural to want to be a part of that and imitate it. Unfortunately, I have to play the stifling white person right now. <laughs> you do it best. <laughs> Because unfortunately, we have a time limit. This has been fantastic. I want us all to thank everybody for coming. Vanessa Jones, Ananda Lewis, Little X, Larry Robinson. Thank you very much. And I'd like to call up Karachi of the Black Arts Festival to tell you about the events this weekend. This is the inaugural event in a very important series of events. Hi, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, just so you know, we will be having a performing arts show tonight as well at 8 o'clock in Lowell Lecture Hall. I encourage all of you to come. It should be as enlightening as this forum was, I hope. Um, also, this is a not just a one shot event. We have a series of things going on this weekend. Um, we're also going to be addressing hip hop tomorrow evening in a movie called Hip Hop New World Order. Um, the director of the movie will be there as well and I encourage all of you to come. It's at the Carpenter Center. For a detailed listing of events, there are programs to the side where, at the door where you'll be leaving. Please grab one. Learn more about the festival. Um, I did see Joanna Paretsky, president of Kumba, and Sheldon Reed back there somewhere. Um, they're really, Sheldon's right there. Um, he is very much responsible for the Black Arts Festival even being in existence, and I want to thank him so much for his support as Kumba director. Um, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy the weekend. Goodbye.